Good morning. After you get your song of invitation marked, you may want to turn back to John chapter 6. If you've already left that passage, that's where we'll be spending most of our time this morning. John chapter 6. Beautiful day. Good number here. Appreciate all of you being here and your interest in spiritual things. Uh, a few weeks ago, I received a phone call from a gentleman needing a few goats for a youth rodeo. And uh, if you're not familiar with youth rodeos, one of the events that they have is a timed event in which uh, usually younger kids go and uh, they'll have a, a, a small goat staked and uh, the kids run over there and they're timed to see how fast they can flip the goat over and tie their feet together and uh, hog tie them. So I, I knew what he was talking about when he was looking for goats and kind of had an idea of what he was looking for and I said I could get him some. And so a few days later, he came to pick them up and as it turned out, this gentleman was the uh, pastor for the Marion County Cowboy Church, and this was a church rodeo that they were having. And uh, he was an extremely nice guy, and, and so he, he picked up the goats, and uh, we loaded them up, and as he was leaving, he said, I don't know if you attend church anywhere, but if you don't, you should really come to the rodeo. And, uh, and I thanked him for the invitation. And of course, that got my curiosity up. And so a few days later, I looked up the Marion County Cowboy Church on Facebook and saw some of the things they had going on, found this ad that they had for the for their rodeo. And uh, they had also had a professional photographer come to the rodeo and take some pictures. And so I was able to see firsthand what I had uh, subjected these poor unsuspecting goats to for the day. But... Um, <laughs> But I thought it was interesting that this, this church was putting on uh, a community for a community outreach for the unchurched. They were putting on a, a rodeo, a youth rodeo. And a more recent event, I saw this advertisement come up on my Facebook page uh, from, from one of the people that actually a fellow that I've sold goats to before in the past that I'm friends with on Facebook the New Beginnings Church, and they were having a free community outreach with, uh, with live music and stew and a dessert. But you can't drive through. You, can, you have to go in, and uh, you have to stay there and eat. Um, these are efforts by two congregations that just recently I've seen to reach the lost by, by reaching out with these type of activities. And, and no doubt you've, you've seen these type of things a lot. You've, you've seen a, a number of, of congregations trying to reach out in the community with these things. But that got me thinking about John chapter 6. Now, in John chapter 6, it can be argued that John chapter 6 is maybe the key turning point in the popularity of Jesus' earthly ministry. Leading up to John chapter 6, Jesus' fame and His acceptance and His popularity has rapidly been growing. In John chapter 6, his popularity kind of peaks to the point so much that there is a, an effort, an attempt made to basically lead a revolution by his admirers to make him king. And within the chapter, there is a very remarkable and sharp drop-off in his popularity. And that decrease in popularity would continue all the way to the point that some of these very people who are so supportive of him in John 6 will later be the ones crying, crucify him, crucify him. What was it that led to such a change in public opinion of Jesus? Landon read for us the first part of the chapter, and the chapter starts off with the well-known story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So multitudes had been swarming to Jesus. As I said, his popularity is increasing so much so that he told the disciples, let's, let's retreat away to a, a place where we can get some rest. So they cross the Sea of Galilee, go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and the people see where he's going, run around the Sea of Galilee, meet him on the other side. So when he and his disciples get there, there's a large crowd of people waiting for him. And the text says that Jesus, seeing the multitudes, had compassion on them, for they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And as evening approached, he had the multitudes sit down, and there was the men were numbered at around 5,000, besides women and children. 
And with five loaves and two fish, what he did is he fed these 5,000 plus people all that they wanted. And when they gathered up the leftovers, they had more left over than they began with. Jesus had been teaching them things about the kingdom. How would they know that this is the guy they should be listening to? This miracle confirmed that he was not just a teacher, he was a prophet from God. And not just a prophet from God, he was the prophet from God. And they caught on to that. In verse 14 and 15, when they saw the sign that Jesus performed, they said, truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. In other words, the long-awaited Messiah. It had its effect. And the very next verse, verse 15, says this, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take Him by force to make Him king, He departed again to the mountain by Himself alone. This was the tipping point where the people said, all right, that's it. This is the guy. Let's make him king. And what does Jesus do? Jesus came to be king. But what does Jesus do? He withdraws. He goes to the mountain. The story goes on that he's going to cross back over the Sea of Galilee, walking on the water that night, and leave the crowds on that side. At the height of Jesus' popularity, when the people... Without, without being prompted, say, this is the guy we want to be king. Why is it that Jesus pulls back from them at this time? A little bit earlier in John, in John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, this is a different occasion, but Jesus says something that I think lets us know why he did what he did on this occasion. In John 2, 24 and 25, it says, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. When Jesus sees this big popular outcry, we want him to be king, Jesus pulls away because he knows their motives. He knows what's going on with them. He knows why they want him to be king. So the next day, the multitudes are looking for Jesus. Where did he go? And uh, they knew that the disciples got in the boat and went to the other side, but Jesus was still supposed to be on that side, but they couldn't find him. And so after time looking, they finally found some other transportation back across the Sea of Galilee, came to Capernaum, and they found Jesus teaching. And they come to him, and look in verse 25 of John chapter 6. Verse 25. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus knew their motives. And what He knew about them is why they were there, why they wanted Him to be king. And what's proven on the next day is that they're willing to search high and low. They're willing to cross the Sea of Galilee to find Jesus for the loaves and the fish. But Jesus wanted them to seek Him because they desired everlasting life and because they believed that He was the one that could give everlasting life. But that was not why they were seeking Him. And Jesus knew that. And so He points that out. And it's obvious, even by their reaction, that that's not their primary interest. They were seeking Jesus to fill their bellies, not their souls. And, and so look at verse 30. At verse 30, they're like, well, okay, well, give us a sign that you are who you claim to be. He had just performed a sign. And they got the message loud and clear. This is the prophet. But now they want another sign. Why do they want another sign? Well, because they're hungry again. And so they say this. What sign will you perform for us then that we may see and believe? Verse 30. What work will you do 
and then they have a suggestion. We, we've got an idea of a type of miracle you could do. See, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it was written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Do you see what they're suggesting? Perhaps you could provide us another meal. That would be helpful for us. Jesus responds, verse 32. Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Can you provide us something like manna? Can you provide another meal for us? Jesus said, let me tell you what I can provide for you. I can provide you something that gives eternal life. Verse 41. The Jews then complained about Him because He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Now this should cause us to remember something. Do you remember when God gave manna to the children of Israel? Do you remember what they said about that manna? <sighs> this manna. If only we had some meat, if we had something else. They weren't satisfied. They murmured, they complained about the bread that God had provided. What are the Jews doing here? The exact same thing. Oh, you're the bread from heaven. Well, that's not really what we're looking for. That's not really what we want. And so they complained, they murmured about Him because He said, I am the bread from heaven. All we're getting is this guy's teaching. We want something more. Jesus responds in verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to Me. Jesus perceives the problem. The problem is this. They were attracted to Jesus because they thought that He would fill their belly. But physical food was not what God uses to draw people to Himself. And so Jesus tries to point that out. Give us bread from heaven like our fathers did. No, I'm the bread from heaven. Oh, isn't there something more? And Jesus says, you don't understand. The way that people are drawn to my Father is by teaching. You're not interested in my teaching. You're interested in me providing physical bread, but you're not interested in my teaching. And that's the primary way that God draws people to Himself. The prophet says that it shall be that they are taught by God. Therefore, everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. But that's not why they'd come. They came for loaves and fish. And people who come for loaves and fish are not interested in teaching, hearing, and learning. And so Jesus says, you're complaining about the very thing that can give you life. Just like your fathers did. They complained about the gifts that God gave them. Now God's giving you bread that can give you eternal life, and that's not what you want. You want something else. So Jesus, Jesus tries to reason with them. And, and the reasoning is this. You understand that if I provide you physical food right now, you, you know how long that will last, right? Until you're hungry again. As a matter of fact, it won't even keep you alive very long. Everybody who has physical food dies eventually. Your fathers who receive manna in the wilderness, they're all dead now. Look at verse 49. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. Verse 50. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Look at verse 53. Then Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last days. For my flesh is indeed food, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in him, and I in him. Excuse me, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. 
This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Notice this expression here. He who feeds on me. This was troubling to them, and I think it's probably troubling to us some when we read this. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood. You know, uh, one of the things, this passage in particular, one of the criticisms that the pagan uh, Romans had against the, the Christians in the second and third centuries, one of the accusations that they popularized is, you know, they're cannibals. They're cannibals. They believe in eating each other. And, uh, well, it, 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 that sounds startling, doesn't it? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. What's Jesus talking about? I think it's explained. He who feeds on me. He who feeds on me. What does he mean by that? Verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. When Jesus is talking about feeding on him, what is he talking about? Taking in his teaching, taking in his character. Until their desire to feed on Jesus was greater than their desire to feed on the loaves and the fish, they could not have eternal life. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them. Unless they hungered for his teaching, unless they craved his righteousness, unless they desired his character, they would be lost. Only if they desired spiritual life would they find it. And that's what Jesus is trying to convince them to do. Unfortunately, mass of people, but that's not what they're interested in. So verse 60, many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand this? And verse 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Once it was clear that Jesus wasn't going to provide free meals, his popularity greatly declined. But it wasn't God's intent to draw people to himself, who were only interested in their physical needs. And that's tough, I think, for us to recognize because we, we greatly prize uh, meeting our physical needs. Physical things are really important to us. And it may not just be food, but things that appeal to the carnal nature in some way are very, very important to us, top priority for us. And what Jesus was saying is there's got to be something that's even more important. And it has to become more important to you. God never intended to draw people to Himself who were only interested in their physical needs. Go all the way back to when Israel was fed with manna in the wilderness. Moses would say to Israel after that occasion, saying there was a lesson to be learned in that. And the lesson was this, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. God humbled you and allowed you to hunger. God will allow you to go without your physical needs being completely satisfied. And He fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. And here's the reason why. That He might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. There's something more important than the physical things being supplied. The Word of God is what really gives life to man. That's what God was saying back in Deuteronomy. That's what Jesus was telling these people. And until you desire that, you're going to miss what's most vital, what's most important. God wanted people who hungered and thirsted for righteousness. And Jesus said, you know what? When a person hungers and thirsts for righteousness, they're blessed because they'll be filled. They'll find it. They'll find what they're looking for. They'll find something that satisfies them for eternity. People who wanted the teachings of how can I make spiritual correction? People who wanted admonition on how can I be holy? People who want instruction on how can I be the people that God wants me to be? They will be satisfied. 
they will be satisfied. That is who the Father wants to draw to Himself. And so how do you draw people like that? You don't, you don't draw people like that with free meals. You don't draw people like that with a carnal appeal. You draw people like that by offering spiritual teaching. So what happens? These thousands of people that have just crossed land and sea seeking Jesus turn their backs and walk off. Now I want you to try to think about this from Jesus' eyes. Jesus had compassion on these people. He saw them for what they were. They were sheep without a shepherd. They didn't have spiritual direction. He longs to give them spiritual direction. He teaches them about the kingdom. But that's not what they're interested in. And now these souls who He dearly loves are walking away. This is one of the saddest moments, I think, in Jesus' earthly ministry. As He watches these people who He came to seek and to save, but they just don't want what He has to offer. And they walk off. So Jesus turns in verse 67 to the twelve. And He said, you want to go away also? What are you interested in? Why are you here? Why are you following me? Why do you seek me? And they think about it for a second. And Peter speaks up. Verse 68, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What was Peter looking for? It wasn't bread. It wasn't loaves and fish. You have the words of eternal life. And we have also come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're here because we want teaching on eternal life. We're not here for loaves and fish. We're not here for entertainment. We're not here for social acceptance. We're drawn to you because we believe that you can fill our souls. Where else would we go? Where else would we go? And that's why they stayed with Jesus. Well, except for one. He still viewed Jesus as a means for financial gain. And you know what happened to him. Later, when the apostles would go out and teach about Jesus, when they would go out and make disciples, you remember their methods of making disciples? When they went out and preached the gospel, they didn't seek to draw people with free meals or entertainment or any other fleshly appeal. They would go out and in Paul's words, we preach Christ and Him crucified. They preached about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Of course, their message didn't appeal to most people, but it appealed to those who were looking for something more than carnal things, something that would satisfy for more than a moment. And that's who God was seeking. That's the reason why God chose the message that He chose, which was foolishness to the Greeks, a stumbling block to the Jews. But it attracted the people who were hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So there's two points of application I want to make. And the first is this. We need to remember that people are not brought to Christ with meals, with entertainment, or with social inclusion. No one is brought to the kingdom of God by offering free meals. It, that will fill buildings. That does not add to the kingdom. We get confused many times and we think that, well, if we can fill buildings, maybe, maybe then they stand a chance of hearing the Word and therefore, eventually coming to appreciate. 
And that makes sense. But when you look at the appeal of Jesus, when you look at the appeal of the apostles, the appeal of the apostles, we're looking for those that know that's what they're looking for. And so when the apostles went out and taught, they used the message, message of the gospel. And we need to keep that in mind, that people are not brought to Christ, not brought into the kingdom, by appealing to fleshly desires. Verse 45 in chapter 6, It is written by the prophets, They shall be taught by God, therefore everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. How is faith produced? We want to produce faith in people. How is faith produced? Faith is produced by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so our appeal, our desire to make disciples has to be, we have to speak the Word of God and teach the Word of God. Jesus and the apostles did not use a bait-and-switch tactic to try to bring people to God. And we shouldn't either. It doesn't accomplish God's purposes. And that's the reason why at that moment when the people said, we want you to be our king, Jesus withdrew. That won't accomplish God's purposes. God wants me to be king. He wants people to submit to my rule. But not because of a carnal attraction but because of a spiritual need that they see met in me. Secondly, every time I read John chapter 6, I have to ask myself, what is it that I'm seeking? If I would have been in that crowd, undoubtedly, I would have been attracted to Jesus. There were a lot of people that were attracted to Jesus. Why were they attracted to Jesus? the majority of them were attracted to Jesus because I think He can meet my physical needs, which He could. Very few of them were attracted to Jesus because they believed, I believe that He'll meet my spiritual needs and that's a top priority for me. What is a top priority for you? Is it the kingdom of God? Is it salvation? Is it eternal life? Or is it well, I think that Christianity will be great for my family. I think it will put me in good standing with nice people. I think it will, whatever it may be, that's not really spiritual in nature. I, I'm challenged by this. You know, there's a lot of physical blessings in being a Christian. It's very easy, I think, for us to drift over and to start to desire those things and say, you know, I want to follow Christ because this makes my life really pleasant. And, and it does in many ways. And that's wonderful. I'm not discounting that. I'm not saying that's of no value. But we must not let that become the value. The value is the Son of God came to seek and save the lost, and He offers eternal salvation. He offers us something that when everything else is gone, we can still have forever. Is that what we're seeking? Is that why you're here today? Is that what you are striving for? Is that why you want to draw close to Christ? It's because you can be closely conformed to His image, adopted into His family, to be a child of God, to be exalted into the heavenly places to sit with Christ, to have eternal life. Is that what you're seeking? Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of God or the Son of Man will give you. In 53 of John 6, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat my flesh, or eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. That was a strong statement. And what He was saying was this, only if there's a real desire to feed on Him, His teaching, His righteousness, and His character, only if there's a real desire for that will we find eternal life. I want to be sure that Lonnie Oldag doesn't go through this life seeking Jesus, but never really desiring to feed on Him. Never really desiring to internalize who He is. 
never developing and partaking of His character. Because Lonnie Oldag will miss eternal life if that's the case. In verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He's the only one that can fill our souls. There's a lot of people that can fill our bellies. There's a lot of people that can provide for us physically. Jesus is the only one that can fill our souls. Let's make sure we're seeking Him for the right reasons. And when we talk to others, let's make sure we are showing what's the real value of Jesus. This morning, let me ask you, are you partaking of Him? Is your soul being nourished by Him? Spiritually, are you growing? Are you developing? Is, is His work accomplishing in you what the Father intended for it to accomplish in you? That spiritually, you are becoming what you should be. One of the great things about disciples getting together every week is we get a reminder of what's really important in this life. Jesus, in talking about the concern for physical things, how are we going to eat? How are we going to be clothed? How, how are we going to be taken care of physically? Jesus said, don't worry about these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so every time that we're around brethren, we should be reminding each other, you know what's really important, what's really valuable? Let's keep our focus on that. These other things will take care of themselves. And that's right. And so this morning, a reminder to all of us. Are our priorities where they need to be? If they're not, new week, new opportunity to say, let me get my priorities straight. Let me seek what most needs to be sought in my life. Seek and ye shall find. If we're seeking spiritual salvation, God is not far from us. The salvation is near. We can be saved. This morning, can we encourage you, can we help you to partake of the bread of life? We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper in a minute. I don't know that John chapter 6 is, is necessarily a direct reference to the Lord's Supper. But certainly, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the fact that it is in Christ, in His body and blood, that we find the forgiveness of sins, that we find our relationship with God, we find the things that are really most important for now and for eternity. So this morning, if we can help you make correction, if we can strengthen your faith, if we can do anything to help you to be more what God wants you to be, we invite you to come while we stand. While we stand. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.